Hello, my name is Gemma Simmons. I'm a theologian at the Margaret Beaufort Institute of Theology in Cambridge, and I thank you very much for inviting me to your Root and Branch Synod. I'm really sorry that I can't give this talk live. Um, by the time you'll be listening to it, I will be halfway between <clears throat> Cambridge and North Wales on a train, and such circumstances are not really very conducive to uh, good communication. So you've invited me to talk and to reflect with you a bit about um, access to the sacraments, who gets to be invited to the table of the Lord, as it were. And I want to actually go back from that a couple of paces, first of all, to talk with you a bit about um, the sensus fidei, that sense of the faith, that instinctive sense for what is true within the faith that was discussed in Lumen Gentium, the Second Vatican Document um, Constitution on the Church. The German Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner affirmed um, his conviction that every person is the recipient of God's self-communication, every person on the face of the earth, and every believer through the gift of the Holy Spirit has gifts that can be used for the good of the church and the world. So bishops may be leaders of the church, but it's not their church. It belongs to God if it belongs to anyone. And the entire people of God, as it were, have a claim on the church. Um, the supernatural sense of faith of the entire people of God appears in chapter two of Lumen Gentium, which states that this sensus fidei is the characteristic that is shown in the supernatural appreciation of the faith of the whole people, when from the bishops to the last of the faithful, they manifest a universal consent in matters of faith and morals. So far, so good. Part of the difficulty is, though, that it's very difficult to work for us to work out when, from the bishops to the last of the faithful, we manifest a universal consent. Has anybody ever asked us? Would it ever be possible to find out if every single bishop on the face of the earth and every person, every one of the faithful, agreed in matters of faith and morals? Clearly, there are very severe disagreements uh, in various areas. We only have to look at the controversy over uh, contraception in the 1960s, uh, the increasing question now of the role of women in the church, the blessing of same-sex couples, the uh, question of the extent to which uh, women have control over their own body, over their own uh, sexuality, and over their own fertility. These are big issues that continue to divide the church, pastors and faithful among themselves and with each other. So on the one hand, the sense for day refers to the personal capacity of the believer uh, within the communion of the church to discern the truth of faith. But it's also a communal and ecclesial reality. Um, the church isn't made up of one person bands or of lone rangers. So it's the church, the community of the faithful has an instinct by which it recognizes the presence of God and proclaims God's word. We learn our faith in and from the community. Um, our faith is absolutely shot through with communal experience, and it's intrinsically relational. We don't, even those of us who uh, come to faith later on in life as a personal journey, a personal choice, we don't develop a sense of the faith alone, because baptism is not a private enterprise. It always has a communal dimension. And I say all this because as we are trying to work out how we understand who comes to the table of the Lord, who is welcome to partake of the sacraments, we're looking at the very heart of where our sense of the faith and what matters within the faith comes from. 
So um, in 2014, the International um, Theological Commission uh, issued a document about the census for day in the life of the church. And it said that the faithful have an instinct for the truth of the gospel, which enables them to recognize and endorse authentic Christian doctrine and practice and to reject what's false. That supernatural instinct intrinsically links uh, linked to the gift of faith received in the communion of the church enables Christians to fulfill their prophetic calling. So when anyone is baptized in the Catholic Church, they are baptized to share in the threefold ministry of Christ as prophet, priest and king. And it's part of that prophetic calling that we have an instinct of where the faith is and should be leading. It therefore becomes a huge crisis if the faithful begun, begin to experience a distance, a disconnect between them and their pastors. Now, part of the difficulty with this is that traditionally, um, the laity have always been considered, it's been considered proper to the laity to be passive and there was a traditional distinction made between what was called the Ecclesia Docens, the teaching church, and the Ecclesia Dicens, the learning church. So ordinary lay believers <coughs> were, as it were, passive recipients of the knowledge that was dispensed by the hierarchy, who were, by their very nature, teachers of the faith. And um, the ecclesial dynamics of listening and learning, which we see happening around the uh, period of Arius in the fourth century, were eclipsed very much from the 18th century, at least on, by uh, dynamics of ecclesial teaching. And I certainly know that in my more recent years of teaching ecclesiology to um, young men who were preparing for the Catholic priesthood, I always knew I was in trouble if I said something and one of them raised a hand and said, but the magisterium says, and if they really, really wanted to fight dirty, it would be the sacred magisterium says. And if they were absolutely furious with me, I would get the triple whammy of the sacred magisterium of St. John Paul II. Now, I'm a theologian, I'm an ecclesiologist, among other things, by trade. I have a very healthy respect for the magisterium. But the whole teaching of the Second Vatican Council is that we are the magisterium. The magisterium is the whole of the faithful. And that, therefore, it's essential for faith to grow and develop and doctrine and the truth of doctrine to grow and develop, that there is a dynamic of listening, of respectful and serious listening between the teaching and the learning church, as it were. So um, we are being, I think we're being called at this time to pay much more attention to the assistance that the Holy Spirit gives to the whole people of God rather than just one section of it, i.e. the bishops. And I think it's difficult, and the census fidei, the whole doctrine of the census fidei, gives us um, a, a, a challenge to this division between the teaching and the taught, because it recognizes that individuals um, and the community of believers are not passive recipients, but graced by God, they have distinctive gifts to contribute to the church. It's a two-way street, a mutuality between the believer and the community of faith. Um, and in fact, the International Theological Commission states, the whole church, laity and hierarchy alike, bears responsibility for and mediates in history the revelation which is contained in the Holy Scriptures and in the apostolic tradition. So <clears throat> the teaching office of the church, i.e. the bishops, need in order 
faithfully and authentically to carry out their task, need to listen to the experience of the faithful. So when the individual puts faith into practice in the concrete reality of the existential situations in which uh, they find themselves uh, within their family, professional and cultural relationships, these things enrich the personal experience of the believer and helps them to see more precisely the value and the limits of a given doctrine and to propose ways of refining its formulation. That at least is according to the International Theological Commission. So those who teach in the name of the church are required to give full attention to the experience of believers, especially lay people who strive to put the church's teaching into practice in areas of their own specific experience and competence. Well, so far, so good, except that very often in um, issues related to sexuality, to married life, to uh, fertility and questions of raising family, it doesn't seem as if the experience of the ordinary lay faithful is listened to very hard and factored seriously into the formulation and development of doctrine, because that's the other thing. If we've got a sense that doctrine is just something that once it's been stated, that's it forever, we completely fail to take on board the importance of the development of history and also the shifts in culture and the shifts in experience, <clears throat> the experience on which our reflection on our faith is based. I've only got to think of my own lifetime the way in which it simply is no longer possible to express the casual, the um, accepted and understood racism and sexism of the period when I was growing up as a child. It's impossible to think of that now. Um, Yes, there are people, sadly, who are very racist and who are very sexist, but they stand out as being brutal exceptions to the norm now. And that's because culture has changed. Culture has changed in the way, and actually civil law has changed, in the way that we deal with same-sex attraction and um, the desire of homosexual people to live as couples and to raise families. Again, there was a time, and I remember it historically, when um, <clears throat> homosexuality was a crime punishable by law, for men at least, not for women, because apparently Queen Victoria didn't believe there was such a thing as same-sex attraction among women and therefore refused to sign the laws about it. Um, we have seen a huge shift in culture in my lifetime and very much recently in the last 20 years. It's for us as a community of believers to decide and to reflect on whether those changes of culture are actually the enemy of faith or are part of the process of the development of faith. <coughs> Please excuse me. <coughs> But Karl Rahner is convinced that God is a central and constitutive dimension of all creation. Therefore, the kinds of dichotomies that people used to raise in theology between grace and nature, supernatural and natural, human and divine, church and world, cannot be seen as polar opposites anymore, but is seen as a continuum. And if that is how we understand things to be, if we understand that continuum as something dynamic and changing, not because it's weak or because it's um, uh, degenerate, but because it's actually part of how God makes it and how God makes us, then we can't restrict the experience of God only to the explicitly religious realm. 
therefore, where we draw on the, the areas of experience and the areas of expertise we draw on in order to inform our faith are really, really important. I want therefore to look with you very briefly at some slides because I think you've uh, seen enough of my face and at some questions around the sacraments. If our sacramental life, if our ecclesial life becomes more and more um, disconnected from our ordinary experience of life, our ordinary experience of what it is to be a human being, then ultimately the signs will have no sense. The sacraments will have no sense. The definition of a sacrament is a sign which makes real what it signifies. In order for the sign to make real what it signifies, it has to signify something that we recognize as being humanly real. Um, as you know, there has been huge controversy recently in the United States with a very small minority of bishops um, trying to push on a very narrowly understood and interpreted view of um, pro-life issues have been trying to push for a statement which would effectively <clears throat> bar anyone who has liberal views on pro-life issues from receiving the Eucharist. And I was very taken by um, a statement that I found on the internet made by the former provincial superior of the Oregon Jesuits, a man called Father John Whitney. And he says this with regard to who has a place at the table of the Lord. I want to write a longer piece about those bishops who seek to keep some from the table of Christ. But for now, I'll say this. It's not your table or mine. Bishops, priests, etc. are neither the hosts, nor the bouncers, nor the ones who wrote the guest list. The Eucharist is the resurrected body of Christ given for the life of the world. Jesus Christ is the one who invites the guests, all you who labour. He is the host of those who come, he is the setter of the table, and he is the feast which is shared. Take this, all of you. This is my body, this is my blood. We are guests at the meal, and sometimes by his calling, serve us. So stay in your lane, please. The wait staff doesn't get to exclude those who want to come. If you don't like the company Christ calls, and admittedly, it is a ragtag bunch of sinners, one and all, it's you who need to leave the table, not them. Powerful, powerful words, particularly given that it comes from a fellow priest, or they come from a fellow priest. But the recent changes uh, in the liturgy, which I have to be honest and say I find lamentable, um, among other things, offer now the Eucharist for many, not for all. And it may be that it's not for that many either, if these uh, bishops in America have their way. It seems to me that that model of church is all about trying to divide, to separate experience of the sacraments from experience of reality. Where there is a church where the teaching element of church, the church is developing its teaching around the lived experience of those who are taught, we have a hope of being able to have a fruitful dialogue between doctrine and experience. Where that dialogue isn't taking place, where that mutual respect is not uh, present, then we are seriously in trouble. So I just want to look with you at, um, I'm going to look for share screen, now it's a little green button, uh-huh. So very briefly, if we look at the church, if we look at this image of Jesus's family tree, we see that it's a family covered, rattling full of skeletons. 
This is Ziga Kuda's painting of the tree of Jesse. We have at the bottom Abraham, of course, our father in faith, who tried to pimp his wife out as his sister to Pharaoh in order to save his own skin. Above him, Moses, who was given the tablets of the law, but who smashed them in a hissy fit, had to be given new ones and was never ultimately able to enter the promised land. To his left, Jacob with his ladder, Jacob who was a cheat and a bandit. And to the right, of course, with his harp, David, who was also once um, described in my hearing by a famous biblical theologian as an oversexed bandit. Above him, his son Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, but who gave up faith and gave up the covenant with God for wine, women and song at the end of it. Opposite him, with his hand raised to Christ, is John the Baptist, who must, within Jesus's family circle, have heard stories about Jesus, and yet was still saying as an adult, are you really the Messiah, or should we be waiting for someone else? Because you don't look very much like the Messiah that I'm expecting. <clears throat> And out of all of this is born Jesus. It is the blood of these uh, nefarious people that runs in his veins. And of course, there is Mary at the top holding her son. In one of the genealogies, there are four women, each of whom has a dodgy sexual past. One wonders what Mary is doing in that group of people. Well, there's an implicit suggestion that there were questions around Mary too. This is the foundation of the faith community, the faith uh, of the church. And therefore, we should expect, we should expect that our faith community is going to be full of sinners. In the stories in the New Testament, whether it's the story of Zacchaeus on the left, with all the admonishing fingers pointing, and the scandal mongering and the whispering and the looking askance, or the prodigal son on the right. If you look at the body language of the three people involved in that story, especially the body language of the brother lurking behind the door. This kind of judgment of the other, this kind of othering of the other, can have no room within the body of Christ. We see very clearly, both in Jesus's praxis and in Jesus's teaching, that he is showing to the people that it must not be so with you. It's going to be different from here on in. It's going to be different in the body of Christ. Just invite you for a moment to have a rest from my voice and look at the hands in the painting. And this is not the church that Jesus founded. And yet from the very beginning, there have been efforts to try and control the dynamism within the church, the dynamism, which is a sort of um, a trajectory towards chaos, because it's very difficult to control the Holy Spirit. And there have been many times in the church where charismatic movements or persons have risen up, and there has needed to be a dialogue between the, um, the magisterium, the teaching church, and the authorities within the church, and the um, the wilder, less predictable, less controllable voice of the spirit. In the institution of the Eucharist, we have the washing of the feet. And here we have Jesus really driving a coach and horses through every cultural expectation of his time, because in his time, the only person who ever washed a man's feet were his wife or his slave. So here is Jesus in one fell swoop, crashing through social categorization by which we exclude one another, by which we value one another as more or less human, more or less valid as a human being. 
And also, of course, he's crashing through gender barriers. No wonder Peter is looking worried. This is the Christ who calls prostitutes to the feast. This is the Christ who insists in his words and in his deeds that the differentiation that we make um, in our communities can no longer hold in the community of the risen Christ. And I want to look very briefly at this painting on the right of the Last Supper, painted in the German college, the Germanicum in Rome, where young men are fast-tracked on to becoming priests and uh, future bishops. And this is in their dining room. So here they are looking at who is a welcome guest in the table of the Lord. Well, in a German context, to have the first person on the left, a Jew, is quite significant. Next to him, a prostitute. Next to her, a beggar. She is a very familiar figure, or was. Uh, she used to beg on the steps of the Germanicum chapel every day. Next to her, the Piero, the clown, who in Ziegacuda's paintings is the outsider, the one who is other who is separated, despised and rejected. Next to him, the scholar, who many um, identify as the Protestant theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died a martyr under Hitler, a Protestant welcome at the table of the Lord. Next to him, Veronica, the woman who comes forward in love and service. And next to her, by the very nature of his skin colour, the one who is different, who is other, who is also wounded, who also wears the blue striped pyjamas of the Holocaust. And all of these people cry out to say, who is welcome? Not only at the table of the Lord, but as members of the family, who is welcome in the family home, so to speak? Jesus gives us a glimpse of the reality, gives us a glimpse of where he sees his presence as most important. And then, as in Emmaus on the left, he disappears from our sight. So I go back to that statement by the former Jesuit provincial. It's not your table nor mine. Bishops, priests, etc., are neither the hosts nor the bouncers nor the ones who wrote the guest list. We are guests at the meal and sometimes, by his calling, servers. The wait staff doesn't get to exclude those who want to come. If you don't like the company Christ calls, it's you who need to leave the table, not them. Brave, brave words, I think. And I was also very much taken by something that Pope Benedict, who's often quoted, I think rather unfairly, by people with a conservative agenda, because he, um, certainly there are elements, great elements of Karl Rahner's thinking uh, within his own uh, theological uh, teaching. Uh, although they weren't, uh, they weren't at one on a number of issues, I think, but he talks in his encyclical on hope about Christianity being not only good news, the communication of a hitherto unknown content. The Christian message is not only informative, but performative. This means the gospel is not merely a communication of things that can be known. It's one that makes things happen and is life changing. The one who has hope lives differently. Well, I would say also that the one who has faith, hope and love lives differently. And therefore, who we accept to the sacraments, whether it's the sacrament of marriage, whether it's the extending of the idea and the concept of marriage as a blessed union of two people wherever, anyone lives in love, they live in God, and God lives in them. So our understanding of same-sex relationships as something that is potentially blessed and holy and God-given because people are born by their very nature uh, in 
uh, with certain attractions, uh, whether it's to members of the opposite sex or members of the same sex. There is a teaching both in canon law and in moral theology that it is uh, unacceptable to try to force a human being to act in a way that is contrary to their nature. So we cannot demand that people who by their most deeply held understanding of who they are, of their identity, if they have at that core level of themselves a same-sex attraction, we cannot force them or attempt to force them into heterosexual uh, relationships. It isn't part of their conditio, their condition as a human being. In the same way around marriage, we have the issue of marriage and the remarriage of people who have not been able, unlike Boris Johnson, to get their marriages, uh, their previous marriages, even if there are several of them, annulled. The whole question of the nullity of marriage is immensely painful. But it seems to me that whereas it is important that we hold to the validity of marriage and to an understanding of marriage as a lifelong commitment, the very fact that we hold to that so strongly means that we must make legislation and we must make pastoral room for the fact that people often enter into marriage in good faith, but there is something intrinsically wrong with the marriage contract that they entered into in the first place. And sometimes that's very easy to prove and sometimes it basically is impossible to prove. So what do we do? Do we leave people outside the door for the rest of their lives? Well, our sisters and brothers in the Orthodox Church have found a solution to this. It seems to me that if to go back to what I was saying at the beginning, if there is a dynamic relationship between the teaching and the taught, if there is a dynamic relationship between faith and experience, all of which is predicated on respectful listening to the truth that emerges from our experience, we should and must do better than to exclude people from the table of the Lord exclude anyone from the family of the Lord. An understanding of sacraments, not as sacred static entities that never shift, but as dynamic realities, a dynamic life that is constantly involve, evolving and is on a spectrum of understanding and a spectrum indeed of participation and belonging. That should help us to be more creative, and more imaginative in how we invite people to the table of the Lord. Thank you for listening.